Mr. President, as faculty marshal, I have the honor to declare the 118th commencement of Carnegie Mellon University, as authorized by the Board of Trustees, to be in session. class of 2015. morning. We gather here in a wonderfully diverse place, diverse in its fields of study, talents and abilities, ethnicities and places that we call home. In light of a respect for others and with an acknowledgement of our differences, I invite you to join with me if you are able and so choose as we pray for this day in the class of 2015. Almighty God, we gather this morning to celebrate the diligent work and incredible efforts of this Carnegie Mellon University class of 2015. We celebrate those who have fulfilled the requirements and effort to, in, to earn bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. We pause for a moment to thank those who have helped us and these students achieve this day. The parents, the family, friends, teachers and professors, and all others who have been a wonderful support to these students. Thank you for the vision and direction of those who have helped to make Carnegie Mellon into the school that it is today. We are grateful for the professors and teachers and staff and administration and alumni of this university who continue to carry out that vision of meeting the changing needs of society and the greater world. Continue to teach these students and us as well to look with compassion on others, both near and far. Take away any arrogance and hatred that may influence us. Give us the grace and the ability to love our neighbors and to seek peace in all areas of life. Bless these students as they enter the next stages of their lives. Be with them as they take steps into the known and the unknown. May all that they do and the decisions that they make honor 
you and the tradition of Carnegie Mellon University. May these graduates bless others as they continue to create and disseminate knowledge and art, continue to serve through their problem solving and leadership skills and respect for others, continue to develop their minds and abilities and dreams to enhance society in meaningful and sustainable ways. Bless also the rest of the world that we may learn to love like you. Be with this day and let these students bring you glory. Our heart is in the work. Amen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, let me welcome you to the 118th commencement of Carnegie Mellon University. My name is Ray Lane. It's my honor and pleasure to serve as board chairman. To all the students who are graduating today, let me begin by congratulating all of you on your achievement. This degree represents years of hard work and self-discipline, discovery, and difficult problem solving. A Carnegie Mellon degree is a sign that you have surpassed a high standard of accomplishment in science, art, and ideas, and that you are ready to use this knowledge in your lives and your future professions. Let me congratulate you and all of us congratulate you on this day. Congratulations, too, to friends and family members, mentors, faculty members, and staff who also take pride in what these graduates have accomplished. Graduation from a demanding academic institution like Carnegie Mellon is a team effort. These students couldn't have done it without you. I invite the graduates to stand, turn around, and join me in thanking your support team with a round of applause, please. <clears throat> Thank you. With us at our 118th commencement are faculty and students from Carnegie Mellon's other locations around the world. Silicon Valley, California, where it's only 8.30 a.m., but Education City in Doha, Qatar, where it's 6.30 p.m., Kigali, Rwanda, where it's 5.30 p.m., and the prize goes to Adelaide, Australia, where it's, <laughs> where it's 1 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> We're delighted to have you all with us today and tomorrow. As graduates of Carnegie Mellon, you are ambassadors for, for what you have come to know as a distinctive university. It was at this university you gained solid grounding in your major field of study. It was here that you collaborated with people whose backgrounds were very different from your own. And it was here that you discovered new ideas about the world and new aspects of yourself. The Board of Trustees believes that it is our job to affirm and maintain the values that underpin this distinctive approach to higher education. I will tell you that no university on the planet has a more engaged and caring Board of Trustees. Many members of the Board are here with me on the platform this morning. I'd like them all to stand to be recognized. Please, Board. Great, great bunch of people. This year, Carnegie Mellon has added to its impressive momentum with a number of new initiatives that are combining or contributing to the growth of knowledge in the world. 
We are moving forward rapidly on ambitious research programs and partnerships in areas ranging from data science, energy, the workings of the brain, and even the science of learning itself. The campus footprint is growing with plans for spectacular new spaces designed to make CMU a standard setter for 21st century higher education. A lot of emphasis is being placed on collaboration across fields of expertise, creative problem solving, and innovation. Behind all of this growth and expansion is our dynamic president, who joined the university just two short years ago from the National Science Foundation, and who has already made a tremendous impact on our institution and on our future. It's my privilege to introduce the ninth president of Carnegie Mellon University, Dr. Subra Suresh. Thank you, Ray. Good morning, everyone. That's, that's more like it. From this vantage point, it's an extraordinarily good-looking group. <laughs> Let me start by expressing my profound appreciation and thanks to Ray Lane for his extraordinary service as chairman of the Board of Trustees of Carnegie Mellon University for the past six years. As you know, Ray, Ray's term will come to an end at the end of next month. And I'm extraordinarily grateful to him for his vision, for his energy, for his support, and his leadership. Let's give him a round, round of applause to show our appreciation. <laughs> Mr. Jim Rohr will join us as the new chairman of the board, effective July 1. Jim is well known in so many different circles, including in the Pittsburgh area where he is a household name. Let's give a round of applause to Mr. Jim Rohr. I would also like to add my thanks to all members of the Board of Trustees for all the encouragement, support, and leadership they have provided in support of the university's plans over the past two years. I would also like to recognize the service of some senior academic leaders. Dr. John Lahasky generously stepped in to serve as interim executive vice president this past academic year, and Dr. Nathan Urban served as interim provost. They both perform their roles with deep dedication to this university. Both of them will be returning to the faculty at the end of next month. John and Nathan, you have our deepest respect, gratitude, and appreciation. Thank you. I would also like to introduce Dr. Farnam Jahanian, who joined Carnegie Mellon University last fall as Vice President for Research, and since then, he's been named the university's new provost. Farnam served for many years on the Faculty of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Michigan. He's a very successful entrepreneur he also did national service as the point person in charge of Computer and Information Science and Engineering Directorate for the National Science Foundation prior to com coming to Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Jahanian is an outstanding addition to our leadership team, and I would like to welcome him and look forward to continue to work with him in his new role as provost, effective tomorrow. I'm especially pleased today to introduce a new tradition into our commencement ceremonies by officially acknowledging the many alumni of Carnegie Mellon 
who are here this morning. Alumni may be recognized by the blue stoles they are wearing today. Attending CMU is a tradition in many families with grandparents, parents, and children having all attended the university. I would like to ask all members of such families to stand and be recognized. Now I would like to invite all alumni who are here to stand and be recognized. The alumni are well represented in the university community by the Carnegie Mellon Alumni Association Board. And it is now my pleasure to introduce the president of the board, Rebecca Allison. Becca earned two degrees from Carnegie Mellon, her Bachelor of Humanities and Arts degree in 1996, and her Master's of Public Management from Heinz College in 2001. Becca lives in Phoenix, Arizona, and has spent her career as a teacher and a, as a university student affairs professional. I would now like to invite Becca to say a few words. Congratulations. You are members of an historic class. Your class of 2015 carries us over the mark of 100,000 living Carnegie Mellon alumni. Yeah. I'm so honored to be here to represent those alumni, to welcome you and congratulate you on this exciting day. I love the energy that exists on this campus. There's almost a palpable energy that crackles in the air at all hours. From those crisp early fall mornings racing across the cut for buggy practice to the balmy early spring evenings as people and music spill out of CFA. This very same energy is buzzing in the stadium today with anticipation, excitement, and pride. You can feel it. This energy is truly the embodiment of the creativity, innovation, and collaborative spirit that makes Carnegie Mellon so unique. In your busiest moments, when deadlines, due dates, and finals were looming, this energy sustained you I am confident that some of this very energy carried you through long nights in the studio, lab, or library. This intense energy provided some warmth in those winter months as you braced yourself against the blowing wind to cross campus. And in quiet, calm moments, this is the rejuvenating and refreshing energy that told you that you were in the right place at the right time. This is a special place that you're leaving today. Take it from me, that you might not find this energy in other places. You'll look for it, you'll seek it out, but you may struggle to find it. You may not realize how much you'll long for it. So my advice to you is, harness it today. Power up. What a great day to do that. Take it with you to infuse your new workplaces and communities. And don't be surprised when others recognize this energy spark in you. They will remark on it and they will be drawn to you because you play to win, because you are the diligent hard workers, creative problem solvers, and transformative leaders. Harness it today while you're still here. Take this energy, carry it out into the world. But here's the most beautiful thing about this energy. There's more waiting to replenish and recharge it, more amazing students to follow after us, and we can continue to support them and ensure that this energy will continue. We can stay connected, we can show pride, and give generously of our time and our talent and our treasure for years to come. 
and eventually you'll miss it and you too will need to tap back into the energy source so you come back and come back often. Every time I return to campus, I'm re-energized, rejuvenated, and reminded of why I love this place. And I promise this will happen for you too. Congratulations again. I'd now like to introduce Ian Glasner, president of the student body. Ian is graduating today with a double major in electrical and computer engineering and business. Please join me in welcoming him. Challenge. If I could describe my Carnegie Mellon experience in one word, it would be challenge. When I say challenge, I'm not simply talking about the first computer engineering exam I took freshman year. I am actually more so referring to the subsequent phone call I had to give my mom telling her that I failed. <laughs> Things didn't exactly start off as planned. At the time, it felt like Carnegie Mellon had completely knocked me over. But we've all learned things here, like that a 0% chance of rain really means the weather forecaster is just hoping it doesn't rain. <laughs> Those days usually end with muddy shoes and a soaking wet backpack. Or that counting on a Pittsburgh bus to show up on time is a great way to be very, very late. <laughs> By knocking us over, Carnegie Mellon has taught us how to get back up. And sometimes, getting back up involves drinking a Red Bull or several cups of coffee in the basement of Hunt Library alone at 2 a.m. on a Saturday. We've all been there. We've all learned. I hope everyone brought an umbrella today. Everyone here today has hit a bump in the last four years, and we've all gotten back up after. CMU has been a challenge, but class of 2015, we made it. Look around. In less than 90 minutes, we will all be graduates of Carnegie Mellon University. Today, I would like to share with you the first of many incredible achievements I hope that our class will have as alumni. The Board of Trustees challenged our class to make a senior gift to campus, something similar to the class of 1987 room in the Cohen University Center. But it's easier said than done. Asking college students to make a donation is a tough sell. Considering many of us have borderline or not so borderline negative bank accounts. The class of 2013 gave it a rate of 6%, and last year's seniors gave it a rate of 15%. Today, I'd like to announce that more than 432 members of our class contributed. That's well over 30%. It's more than double last year, and it's an all-time record for Carnegie Mellon. In a few days, we will be spread out across the country and the world, just like we were four years ago. Let's not make this the last time we are all in Pittsburgh together. Five, 10, 50 years down the road, remember Carnegie Mellon University. Remember where you learned how to get back up and keep going. So long, class of 2015. May your futures be bright and your hearts forever in the work that we all did here together. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, and to the entire class of 2015, congratulations again. Your determination, your leadership, and your passion to make a difference will set new, continue to set new records.
for Carnegie Mellon University, no matter where you reside in the future. I'm now pleased to introduce another wonderful member of your class, our student speaker, Brooke Quay. She was selected to speak today by a committee of faculty, staff, and students. Brooke is graduating with a major in physics and a minor in professional writing and intends to pursue graduate study in material science in the fall. Brooke. this day four years ago, this isn't what I thought it would look like. I thought I'd have it all figured out by now. I thought I'd know exactly who I was, where I was going, what direction my life was going to take. I thought I'd be so ready to get out of here and dive into a world where I'd make big changes and be respected and find success around every corner. But instead, I'm scared. I'm scared to leave this Carnegie Mellon bubble where I live with my best friends, where I know every shortcut around campus like the back of my hand, where the baristas at the Starbucks on Forbes and Craig scribble down my name without even having to ask. Maybe you're like me. Maybe some part of you is scared to leave the group me chats the annoying but familiar beeping of the crosswalk at Moorwood, the tipsy journeys down Beeler, the long lines at La Prima, the concerts, carnival, the wine and cheese nights with red solo cups. I'm scared because for the past four years, my life has been organized by post-it notes and lists, and I've diligently crossed off the problem sets and essays one by one. We all complained about how busy we were, but we all know it was actually a competition of who was the busiest. It wasn't easy. I changed my minor four times. I cried when I got my first C, and I learned the limits of sleep deprivation. But we were always surrounded by friends to talk to, professors who inspired us, and a community that changed us, the way a writer revises a piece, with love, little by little, until we slowly evolved into different people. But now we're here. Now we're gently being nudged out of the safe and nurturing world where even the weather was predictable, always rain. <laughs> the most frightening part about the future is the uncertainty, the worry that your dreams could come crashing down on you just as easily as they could be achieved. Whether you're starting your first real job or going to med school or grad school or still trying to figure out what you want, the future may seem obscured by fog. But the best part about uncertainty is that it's equivalent to possibility. I've sometimes found myself lamenting over the things I should have done. I should have tried out for dancer symposium instead of chickening out before auditions. I should have taken more philosophy classes. I should have stayed on the Frisbee team. Should have said I love you more often. Should have gone out more or gone out less, <laughs> or learn how to use that expensive and hipster DSLR camera I bought instead of relying solely on my iPhone and Instagram filters. Should have said more to that cute barista than, can I have a tall chai, please? <laughs> but what am I saying? <laughs> this is just the beginning. It wasn't that long ago when we went out to bars for the first time and got our Viking hats from Peter's Pub. 
We've got our entire lives ahead of us. We've got all the time in the world to do the things we want to do, visit the places we want to see, become the people we've always dreamed of becoming. Who did you want to be when you first got here? When I first came to Carnegie Mellon, I wanted to be an astrophysicist. I wanted to look up at the night sky and understand how we came to be made of stardust on this little planet in this infinite universe. I've discovered new interests since then, we all have, but this amazement, this wonderment of the world, this sense of unbounded possibility is something we must fiercely hold on to. Throughout college, there were plenty of times when the workload was too much, when the stress felt overwhelming, when I wondered if it was time to give up. But the thing about Carnegie Mellon is that inspiration is everywhere. Whether it's one of those nerdy moments when you learn something in one class that clicks with something from another class, or the pride you feel when you see your friends on stage during Greek Sing or Culture Night, or the excitement of reading about one of your professor's research in the news, something always keeps the spark going, pushing you to keep growing, oftentimes in ways you weren't even expecting. As Carnegie Mellon students, we're sometimes so determined and driven that when we set goals for ourselves, it's strange to see them change or even fail. I thought I was gonna be a physicist, but now I'm becoming an engineer. My boyfriend is graduating as an engineer, but now he wants to be an entrepreneur. Some of you were shy when you first got here and then became organization leaders and performers and mentors. But that's why we don't have just one school color. We're plaid. Carnegie Mellon taught us to get out of the little box we might have put ourselves in, to explore the possibilities, to realize how many different roles we have the intellect and the talent to pursue in this world. This is how Carnegie Mellon has made me stronger, how it's made you stronger, and what we should all take with us when we leave. As we go through our lives, let's continue to keep our eyes wide and our minds open because although there are some of you who took a perfect path, that's not always the only path. Look at the moon, isn't it beautiful? My dad asked me during one of my uninspired slumps. Yeah, I sniffled wondering where he was going with this. But it's only ever a full moon once a month, he continued. Most of the time, it's just a crescent or a half moon. It's almost never a full moon, yet it's always beautiful. None of us are perfect, and few of us are sure of exactly what we want yet. We all break sometimes, but we've also all made it to this day, to the brink of the rest of our lives, and we're ready for it. What we learned, enjoyed, and discovered along this roller coaster ride we call Carnegie Mellon is how true success, happiness, and full potential are achieved. We might be going our separate ways after we graduate, but we'll never forget the time we spent here together, growing together, doing first together, becoming great people together. Let's take the strength we've gained through this transformation and tackle the future in front of us. I want to thank my friends, my family, and my professors for always believing in me. Thank you for the late night conversations, for the unwavering support, for the life philosophies. Thank you for being the mirror that reflects a better version of myself back at me. And on behalf of all my fellow classmates, thank you to everyone who has helped us become Carnegie Mellon graduates. When I pictured this day four years ago, this isn't what I thought it would look like. I thought I'd have it all figured out by now. I thought I'd know exactly who I was, where I was going, what direction my life was gonna take. 
I thought I'd be so ready to get out of here and dive into a world where I'd make big changes and be respected and find success around every corner. But instead, I'm even better off. Sure, I don't know exactly who I am yet, but I do know that I can be anyone. You can be anyone. So, class of 2015, I challenge you to embrace the uncertainty. I challenge you to find passion, to want something, to walk to the sky for it. I challenge you to let go of the fears while holding on to each other. Let's take the knowledge, the strength, and the confidence that we've learned here together, and let's go make this world ours. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. It was wonderful and inspiring. And now we come to the presentation of special doctor's degrees awarded to honor individuals who have had extraordinary impact in areas that reflect Carnegie Mellon's strengths in the arts, sciences, scholarship, and society. Recipients of these honorary degrees have in common a notable record of accomplishments in their chosen fields, and they each have made, in their own domains, substantial contributions for the advancement of knowledge, the enrichment of the arts and culture, and to bettering the well-being of humanity. Interim Provost Nathan Urban will present each candidate and cite the achievements that merit this honor. Then all candidates will together receive their degrees and their doctoral hoods. Please note that Judaya Pearl was to have received a Doctor of Science and Technology degree today, but he is unable to join us to a, due to a family illness. Our thoughts go out to Dr. Pearl and his family. Carnegie Mellon plans to confer the degree on Dr. Pearl at a future commencement ceremony. Dr. Nathan Urban. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. Will Joyce Kozloff please come forward? Joyce Kozloff, since receiving your Bachelor of Fine Arts degree at Carnegie Tech in 1964, you have become one of the foremost visual artists of your generation. In your work in diverse media, you celebrate and explore the meaning of ornament, pattern, maps, charts, and found materials from diverse world cultures. You have forged a unique artistic language that with beauty and power expresses your own passionate commitment to causes of peace and human rights. For your artistic achievements and your vision of social justice, Carnegie Mellon is pleased to award you the degree of Doctor of Fine Arts. <laughs> Will Kaifu Lee please come forward? <laughs> Kaifu Lee. Since your days as a PhD student in computer science at Carnegie Mellon, you have taken to heart the essence of our university. You have aimed to be the best in the world at what you undertake. You have applied this principle to revolutionizing speech recognition, to business leadership, and now to venture investing. You have influenced millions of people around the world, encouraging them to follow their passions solve problems, and work with others. For your contributions to technology, business, and humanity, Carnegie Mellon is pleased to award you the, doctor, the degree of Doctor of Business Practice. <clears throat> Will
Will Stephen Schwartz please come forward? <laughs> Looks like you picked a good one. <laughs> Stephen Schwartz, in your long and amazing career, you have produced a one-man renaissance of Broadway musicals that thrill and delight audiences all over the world. From your scotch and soda days at Carnegie Mellon, to your hit musicals like Pippin, Godspell, and Wicked, to your work in such animated films as Pocahontas and Enchanted, your music and lyrics sparkle with wit, warmth, and insight. You bring magic shows and miracles to life for all of us, challenging our minds and lifting our spirits. For your ongoing achievements and creative contributions to the American Musical Theater, Carnegie Mellon is pleased to award you the degree of Doctor of Fine Arts. <laughs> Will Carl Wyman please come forward? Carl Wyman, you shared the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2001 for your pathbreaking work on atomic physics, but since that honor, you've dedicated your intellect, prestige, and energy to the cause of better teaching. You want nothing less than to revolutionize the way science is taught everywhere. Using principles of learning science and student engagement, you are setting a high standard for university science instruction that is helping more students to succeed in these challenging disciplines. You have been a special inspiration to Carnegie Mellon's Simon Initiative in Technology Enhanced Learning, and you are a valued member of the Global Learning Council. For your brilliant achievements as a physicist and for your impact as an educator, Carnegie Mellon is pleased to award you a degree of Doctor of Science and Technology. Will Alan Alda please come forward? <laughs> Alan Alda, as actor, writer, director, and science nerd, you are a CMU kind of guy. Your portrayal of Hawkeye Pierce in the series MASH defined an era of American television comedy. In your later acting and directing career, your own special brand of dramatic genius shone through. And in all your productions, you always entertain, sometimes provoke, and frequently move audiences. You love to learn new things, and your skills as a communicator have allowed you to share your enthusiasm for science and engineering with worldwide television audiences where you clearly convey your own under, underlying wonder at the nature of discovery itself. For your achievement of excellence in these diverse fields, Carnegie Mellon is pleased to award you the degree of Doctor of Fine Arts. Alan Alda, Joyce Kosloff, Kai Fu Lee, Stephen Schwartz, and Carl Wyman, by virtue of the authority granted to me by the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer these degrees upon you with all the rights, honors, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining thereto. Congratulations. Congratulations. This is what is so unique and wonderful about Carlegie Mellon, this eclectic group of high achievers. Congratulations. Thank you.
It is now my great honor to introduce our commencement speaker today. Although I was a fan of Alan Alda, the actor, for a very, very long time, I had the pleasure of having a meeting with him as a science communicator just a few years ago in Washington, where we hit it off right away. Alan's quick wit, his deep, deep curiosity about science, and his engaging energy came through to everyone who met him that day with me. If anyone embodies Carnegie Mellon's blending of the arts and the sciences, it is surely Alan Alda. And I'm delighted to welcome him to the lectern as our keynote speaker today. Alan. All around the country today, distinguished men and women are looking at graduates like you from the heights of our achievements and spraying advice at you. <laughs> it's, it's an indignity you have to suffer before they lift the latch and release you into the wild. <laughs> In settings like this today, you're going to hear all over the country many of the same themes. Be true to yourself. Follow your passion. You are the future. Don't make a mess of the world the way we did. <laughs> I, I know these words because I've said many of them myself often. And they're good ideas. The only thing is they, they're a little vague, I think. And every time I'm tempted to make a speech like that, I, I wish instead I could just give you a few good tips on how just to get through life. Like, like the admiral last year who gave one of these speeches, his advice was so concrete, so simple. He said, if you want to change the world, make your bed every day. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? I love that. It's so... <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's, the utter, it's utter simplicity. I mean, if you can start off a day with a little discipline like that, there's no telling what you can accomplish when the hard stuff comes your way. The problem is I can't really give you that advice myself because I don't make my bed every day. <laughs> I do. I unscramble the covers and I pull them up to the pillow so it looks sort of neat. But I, I don't make it, you know, all so tight that you can bounce a quarter on it the way the admiral does. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at your face as you're thinking, why are they having this guy up here talk about making his bed? <laughs> There's actually a reason for why I'm saying this. I think it's important as you leave here today, if you haven't already done it, to start paying attention to how your own particular brain works. You know, the Admiral likes a hard discipline approach the experience of being tough, he, he likes that. And, and I'm sure a lot of you benefit from that too. But I'm, I'm a little more flexible. I pull the covers up just enough so the next time I look at them, it'll be a little gift to myself and I'll get a little jolt of some happiness hormones when I look at it. And that's good for me, that's the way I like it. The point is that there's no good or bad way to start the day, I don't think. But I think you can learn to get the most out of your particular, your own brain, if you pay attention to how it works. I used to push my brain, you know, sort of like the way a jockey would whip a horse, trying to make it run faster than it can run. But now I'm, I'm more tolerant of the way my brain works. I'm easier on it. I get it pointed in a certain direction. And it works in the background in its own time. And when it's ready to come up with the goods, it lets me know. But the thing is, it takes time. You know, I, I bring this up because if I'm, if I'm going to pass anything on to you today, it has to be real to me. For instance, my grandson Scott is graduating today, and that's very real. That's real to me. And so is the fact that he'll be entering my field. 
he's going to be facing a lot of uncertainty. But, you know, I, uncertainty is not always a bad thing. In fact, I, I kind of welcome uncertainty. I think instead of resisting it, you can surf uncertainty. You know, keep your balance, stay agile. Un expect the unexpected bumps. It's, it's harder to do when uncertainty comes at you like a tsunami, but it's a good principle to live by. The thing is, it's not just Scott who's going to be going out facing uncertainty in his chosen field. Every one of you here today is going to face uncertainty. It's going to hit you. You'll face it no matter what you do, and sometimes it'll make you rethink what you're doing. And here's an interesting thing. Uncertainty usually comes from the outside, but sometimes it can come from your own heart. If you suddenly are up against a situation where you remember what your own principles are, what your values are, sometimes the choice can be difficult. I'll give you an example. My wife just wrote a book about people who were brought up in the Bronx. And I, I'm at <laughs> the Bronx, right, good, very good. <laughs> Excellent. Read the book, you'll love it. <laughs> so I met one of the people in the book that she, that she inter interviewed. And he told me such an interesting, powerful story about this thing I was just talking about, about knowing your values and coming up against them, coming up against something in your own heart. He came from a working class family and his, his father had lived through the depression. And his father told him constantly, be a plumber. People will always need plumbing. But this was a very smart kid, and he went to medical school, and he was so smart that as a young man, he invented a, a device that would save lives. And a medical company offered him hundreds of millions of dollars for the patent to the, to the device. The only thing was they were going, for some reason, they were going to hold it back from putting it on the market for a whole year before they started selling it. Now that meant that he could either release it to the public right away and start saving lives, or he could take the hundreds of millions and wait a year. And his father, who had lived through the depression and kept telling him, be a plumber, his father said, don't do it. Don't take the money. He said, think of all the people, the mothers and children who will die during that year while this company is waiting to put it on the market. Put it out there now. And, and then when he, every night when he went to bed, the, the father would say to him, when you wake up tomorrow and you look in the mirror to shave, don't look at yourself. Don't think about your own image. Think about those mothers and children who are going to die if you wait for a year. So what do you think? Did he take the money or did, he, or did he put it out on the market? He had to make a decision. It was a very tough decision. And sometimes you have to make really tough ones and they come at you unexpectedly like that. But you can certainly surf uncertainty better. You can find your balance better if you know how to respond to your own principles. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you what he did. He didn't take the money. And decades later, when he told me the story, he was really happy about it because he did what he thought was right. And it makes him, good, it makes him feel good to know that. But here's the thing, that was many years ago. In those days, we had time to think things through. We had time to consider these things. You don't have that luxury so much anymore. All of a sudden now, things are going really fast. Let me, let me give you an example of how fast things are going. I love, I love this example. A few years ago, the internet was flooded with copies of a graduation speech that Kurt Vonnegut had given at MIT. It spread across the country. It spread all over the internet, all over the world. And it did that in just a few hours. That's how fast it was. It was quoted everywhere. And I'd like to read some of it to you. I, I love it because it gives very simple advice, clear-cut, everyday, how to live your life advice. 
He said, here's a few words for the graduating class. Wear sunscreen. If I could offer you only one tip for the future, sunscreen would be it. The long-term benefits, the long-term benefits of sunscreen have been proven by scientists, whereas the rest of my advice has no basis more reliable than my own meandering thoughts. I will dispense this advice now. Enjoy the power and beauty of your youth. Oh, never mind. You will not understand the power and beauty of your youth until they've faded. But trust me, in 20 years, you'll look back at photos of yourself and recall in a way you can't grasp now how much possibility lay before you and how fabulous you really looked. You are not as fat as you imagine. <laughs> Sing. Don't be reckless with other people's hearts. Don't put up with people who are reckless with yours. Floss. <laughs> Remember compliments you receive. Forget the insults. If you succeed in doing this, show me how. <laughs> Stretch. Get plenty of calcium. Be kind to your knees. You'll miss them when they're gone. Get to know your parents. You never know when they'll be gone for good. Be nice to your siblings. They're your best link to your past and the people most likely to stick with you in the future. Don't expect anyone else to support you. Maybe you have a trust fund. Maybe you'll have a wealthy spouse. But you never know when either one might run out. Be careful whose advice you buy. Advice is a form of nostalgia. Dispensing it is a way of fishing the past from the disposal, wiping it off, painting over the ugly parts, and recycling it for more than it's worth. <laughs> but trust me on the sunscreen. Now the thing about this charming piece by Kurt Vonnegut is that it wasn't written by Kurt Vonnegut. It was written by a newspaper columnist in Chicago called Mary Schmitch. Some unknown person had posted it on the internet saying it was written by Kurt Vonnegut. And it spread all around the world in hours with his name attached to it. Schmitch said it went to Italy and France, to Israel and Brazil, to places I didn't know had electricity. And she said even Mr. Vonnegut's wife, the photographer Jill Kremens, received it, emailed it to several friends, and then asked her husband, why didn't you tell me you spoke at MIT? And he said, because I didn't. Somebody said it was the most widely distributed piece of email in the history of the internet. But after only a few hours of bouncing around the world, it was identified as a hoax, and in a flash, the internet was flooded with retractions. By the end of one extraordinary day, vast numbers of people had accepted and then rejected a worldwide hoax. And that's what makes this, this internet event a great image for the age we live in now. There were probably just as many lies going around now as there ever were. But these days they're traveling at the speed of light and with the help of an engine for repetition that works on a scale unheard of in human history. The lies stick. People are still sending around that talk saying it was written by Kurt Vonnegut. All right, so big deal, you may be thinking. You may, you may be thinking it's just a few jokes about youth and beauty and, and trivial things, but think about it. It could be selling you anything. It could be a cult religion that could separate you from friends and family, or a quack medicine that could leave you paralyzed, or bogus political information that could decide an election. Being able to know what's true and what's a lie is a lot harder to do now, harder than ever before. And so now, more than ever, you need the wisdom of a trusted partner, or a friend, or a mentor, Somebody who can remind you of what counts. Now, more than ever, I think, you need to know who you are and what you believe in. And who you are is a tough one. 
because most of us have many people inside us. But in your finer moments, you aspire, you aspire to things that make sense. Even while you're enjoying a momentary distraction, you know that down the road, something's going to come along that's going to require skill, ability, and you're going to know you can't wing it. So you're going to be prepared for it. You're going to know that one of the deepest pleasures comes from knowing how to do something that's hard well. And you'll be prepared. You'll take the time that it takes to learn it. We have a challenge about time now. So let yourself be all the yous that you are. But don't let them crowd out the smart one. And as for what you believe in, values are really not so much what you say as what you do. The more you bring those two things into line, the easier it'll be to get where you're going. You know, you may say you want to go to Chicago, but it's going to be hard to get there if you keep buying tickets to Las Vegas. I think we don't realize how important time is. When we couldn't communicate at the speed of light, we didn't think about it that much. But things do take time, like the time it takes for your brain to work on a problem. And chemical reactions take time. Mourning a loss takes time. In fact, all the transitions of our life take time. Getting your brain or your body in shape takes more than a weekend, no matter what they tell you in the brochure. It takes time for a species to adapt to changes in the environment that we cause, which makes us one of the most dangerous species that's ever lived. We can make changes in the environment so rapid that nature doesn't have time to replenish species that can live in that changed environment. Now, I don't want to kid you into thinking I've got this all worked out and I know how to do it. I'm still working on it myself. But this is what I aspire to. So this is real to me and I'm passing it on to you. So as you make the transition from this page in your life to the next chapter, I wish all of you what I wish for Scott. I wish you health, happiness, resilience, love, laughter, patience, cash, <laughs> strength, plenty of time, and a friendly relationship with your own brain. And if all else fails, floss and wear your sunscreen. Thank you and good luck. Thank you, Alan, for those wonderful remarks. You've inspired and uh, enlightened us all. At this point, I'm very pleased to recognize our faculty a group of scholars, scientists, artists, and above all, teachers. Every year, esteemed and dedicated faculty members retire, and it is my honor now to recognize those who are retiring this year. Please stand as I read your name. Patricia Bellin Gillen. Stubnitz Professor, Stubnitz Professor of Art from the School of Art. Al Bloomstein. The J. Eric Janssen, University Professor of Urban Systems and Operations Research of the Heinz College. Edmund Clark, the Four Systems University Professor from the Department of Computer Science. Chris Hendrickson, the Hammerschlag University Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Wotek Mali, UA and Helen Whitaker Professor, the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Jack Mostow, Research Professor of the Robotics Institute. Charles Newman, Professor, the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. 
Joan Stein, Principal Librarian for Assessment, Marketing, and Training. Don Sutton, <laughs> Professor of History and Anthropology of the Department of History. <laughs> and Dick Tucker, <laughs> Dick is the Paul Mellon University Professor of Applied Linguistics, the Department of Modern Languages. Please join me in thanking all of Carnegie Mellon's retiring faculty for their commitment and years of service to the university. We will now begin the formal conferral of degrees on all students who have duly completed the requirements of their programs to the satisfaction and approval of their faculty members. We will ask degree candidates from each college to stand and be recognized in turn as you are introduced by your dean. When all schools and colleges have been recognized, the president will ask students to stand again and he will formally confer your degrees. Got that? Okay. Okay. The commencement program gives each student's degree in areas of study, which will be called out and celebrated at the department diploma ceremonies. I encourage families and friends to look and listen beyond just your own graduates listing to get a sense of the unique educational environment at Carnegie Mellon and also to appreciate the many areas of interest and expertise in this graduating class. I want to begin by acknowledging the achievements of this year's group of doctor's degree candidates. These outstanding scholars received their academic hoods at a special ceremony last night. In earning their doctorates, they have made a commitment to a life of scholarly pursuits and have reaffirmed the importance and prominence of Carnegie Mellon as one of the nation's premier research universities. I would invite the doctor's degree candidates to please rise and be recognized. be seated. In addition, we are pleased today to also officially confer bachelor's degrees to students graduating from Carnegie Mellon University Qatar. These students earned degrees from the Dietrich College, the Mellon College of Science, the School of Computer Science, and the Tepper School of Business. At this time, I want to recognize the Dean of Carnegie Mellon University Qatar, Dean Ilker Bebars, who, will continue to do, who continues to do an outstanding job leading the campus in Doha. Dean Baybars, please stand and be recognized. For the conferral of degrees at the university level, when we call for degree candidates to stand, we will be calling for the broad categories of bachelor, uh, bachelors, <laughs> masters, and doctoral level candidates. I will now call the dean of each school or college to present its candidates for degrees. All degrees will be conferred upon students as a group after all schools or colleges have been presented. To begin, I want to recognize James Garrett, Dean of the College of Engineering. Will all of the candidates from the College of Engineering please rise? Mr. Provost, upon the recommendation of our faculty, I have the honor of presenting the bachelors, masters, and doctoral candidates from the College of Engineering. Will the new College of Engineering graduates please be seated? I now recognize the Dean of the College of Fine Arts, Dan Martin. Thank you. Will all of the candidates from the College of Fine Arts please rise? <laughs> Mr. Provost, upon the recommendation of the faculty, I present, I'm 
proud to present the bachelor's, master's, and doctoral candidates from the College of Fine Arts. Congratulations. Please be seated. Thank you. I will now recognize the Dean of the Dietrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences, Richard Shinus. Dr. Shinus is completing his first year as Dean, and in that time he has contributed much to the programs of the college and contributing to the leadership of the university as a whole. Will the candidates from the Dietrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences please rise? Mr. Provost, upon the recommendation of our faculty, I have the honor of presenting the bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degree candidates from the Dietrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Well done. Please be seated. I now recognize the dean of the Heinz College, Ramaya Krishna. Will all the candidates from the Heinz College please rise? <laughs> Mr. Provost, upon the recommendation of our faculty, I have the honor of presenting the master's and doctoral degree candidates from the Heinz College. <laughs> Will the new Heinz College graduates please be seated? I now recognize the Dean of the Mellon College of Science, Fred Gilman. Will all the candidates from the Mellon College of Science please rise? <laughs> Mr. Provost, upon the recommendation of our distinguished faculty, I have the pleasure and honor of presenting the bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degree candidates from the Mellon College of Science. Well, the Mellon College of Science uh, gra uh, graduates, please uh, be seated. <laughs> I now call on the Dean of the School of Computer Science, Andrew Moore. <laughs> dean Moore returned to Carnegie Mellon this year to lead the School of Computer Science after his successful tenure at Google's Pittsburgh office. We are delighted to welcome him back to CMU as a dean. Will all the candidates from the School of Computer Science please rise? <laughs> Mr. Provost. Uh, upon the recommendation of the distinguished faculty of the School of Computer Science, I would ask for uh, conference of the degrees for uh, the masters, bachelors, and doctoral candidates. <laughs> well, the graduates of the School of Computer Science, please sit down. <laughs> I now call on the Dean of the Tepper School of Business, Robert Damon. Will all the candidates from the Tepper School of Business please rise? <laughs> Mr. President, upon the recommendation of our distinguished faculty, I have the honor of presenting the bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degree candidates from the Tepper School of Business. Will the new Tepper School graduates please be seated? Carnegie Mellon is justifiably well known for its success in interdisciplinary research and education. This has given rise to several university-wide inter-college and joint degree programs. I'd now like to present the candidates for degrees from these special programs. Will all of the bachelor's, master's, and doctoral candidates in the interdisciplinary programs please rise? Mr. 
President. Upon recommendation of our faculty, I have the honor of presenting these candidates from our university-wide inter-college and joint degree programs. Thank you, Nathan. By virtue of the authority granted to me by the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer these degrees upon these candidates with all the rights, honors, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining thereto. I'm pleased to join the deans and the faculty of the entire university in congratulating you. Congratulations. I would now officially welcome you as the newest of more than 100,000 global alumni of Carnegie Mellon University. You have much to be proud of. Today is as much about looking ahead as it is looking back. As you anticipate your next endeavor, I would like to encourage you to do so, confident in the knowledge that CMU has equipped you for whatever comes next, and in ways that are totally unpredictable today that you might not, might not even recognize. You already know that you've been deeply educated in your major field of study. Employers around the world tell us consistently that CMU graduates are exceptionally well prepared to contribute to their organizations from day one. You know how to conceptualize a complex problem, frame a novel interpretation, show extraordinary artistic talent, and work effectively on team. The content knowledge you acquired here will almost certainly require renewal. But the conceptual foundations you have established will allow you to continue to learn over the course of your lives. But I want to suggest that you've also been learning other lessons, both inside and outside the formal curriculum. You've been immersed in an environment that thrives on innovation, collaboration, collegiality, and a creative response to the unexpected. You learned to invent new things, to work with others on a club activity, a buggy team, on a community project. You learned to communicate with people who are different in background and style of working. These are critical skills for the future, and the world where the momentum of innovation will only accelerate. None of us can predict how these threads will intertwine through our lives. Small moments can circle back in our lives in ways that are totally unforeseen. You cannot imagine them today. Let me give you a few examples. On the 24th of August, 1977, I took my maiden flight, traveled over several thousand miles, and landed in Ames, Iowa for a graduate study in mechanical engineering at Iowa State University, a step that will permanently force me to speak with an Iowa accent. I turned on my, within a few days of arriving, I turned on my first American TV. Most of you will not know what it was like. Small, vacuum tube, black and white. And what was on? The very first image I saw on my first American television was the image of Hawkeye Pierce. from the sitcom MASH starring Alan Alda. 
At that moment, I would never, ever have believed that I would meet this world-famous actor or have the opportunity to discuss science literacy with him at the National Science Foundation, let alone award him an honorary degree right here at Carnegie Mellon University. <laughs> Traveling to Iowa State University for me was only possible because I received a travel grant from a trust established by the Indian major industrial conglomerate taught us. Two years ago, on this very stage, Mr. Ratan Tata received an honorary degree and I met him here at Carnegie Mellon University. How could I have ever known in 1977 that this will be the path I will take? None of us can predict the trajectory of our lives and careers. Carl Wyman, who grew up in rural Oregon, who received an honorary degree today, struggled to get even to a library close to the house that he lived in, which was 100 miles away. More than 50 of, the, 50 of those miles were on unpaved roads. Winning a Nobel Prize in physics was not even in his universe of imagined possibilities. Yet, he did win a Nobel Prize in 2001 for his pioneering discoveries related to the Bose-Einstein condensate. <laughs> Carl beautifully complements that profound accomplishment with a deep empathy he has today for students struggling to learn science. In 1967, right here on our own campus, a young undergraduate junior wrote a musical written by a fellow student, wrote a musical for Scotch and Soda performed by fellow students that was Stephen Schwartz. The show he called Pippin became a major sensation and remains one of the biggest Broadway hits of our time nearly 50 years after its CMU premiere. I could tell similar stories about many of the people sitting behind me on the stage. Many of the people on whom we have bestowed honorary degrees. Life did not unfold according to any precise plan. But these success stories are built upon the ability to bring to each new circumstance one's individual strengths, purpose, passion, and principles. These are innovators able to pivot, parry, and adapt to the unexpected. And they responded as much from their hearts as from their heads. This will be true in your lives too, as the strands of your lives unfold and intertwine. Things will arise that you did not and could not predict or plan for. That's okay. Your generation has lived with almost nonstop change for your entire lives. You simply expect that new ideas, new tools, and new devices will emerge continually, and that long established truths and practices could be and would be discarded. You are innovators on a scale unprecedented in human history. This is just normal life for you. This explosion of knowledge has come about, at least in part, because many disciplines are coming together more readily than ever before, abetted by technologies of discovery and new sources of data. The confluence of biology, behavioral sciences, and computation underpin advances in brain science. Progress in energy and sustainability requires engineers of every sort, plus economists, architects, designers, policy analysts, historians, and computer scientists. 
The fine and performing arts are continually engaged with science and technology, both as new expressive media and as sources of artistic themes and concerns. No matter what your field is, you have already come to appreciate the creative clash of disciplines. That is something that Carnegie Mellon is very well known for. As we look at the 21st century ahead of you, ahead of all of us, one of the most defining characteristics of the 21st century is the way in which technology impacts human condition. No other university can prepare its graduates at the intersections of technology and human condition as Carnegie Mellon can. <laughs> Alan Alda has the rare and probably even unique distinction of being named for an Oscar, an Emmy, and a Tony, as well as a best-selling best book, all in the same year an incredible achievement. But with the expansion and interconnection of areas of inquiry, new and even more amazing possibilities will emerge. Someday, we could have the possibility that there will be somebody who is nominated for an Oscar, an Emmy, a Tony, the best-selling book, a Turing Award in computer science, and the Nobel Prize all in the same year. And that's likely to happen at Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> the ability to respond productively to unanticipated outcomes, to be open to innovative ideas, and to grow your capacity to work across diverse fields with diverse others, while keeping your hearts in the work, and having your work come from your heart, and connecting to the work that is in your hearts. These brought you here today. They will be even more important for your future, and I'm very confident that you are perfectly ready today. And we, your families, your professors, your mentors, and Carnegie Mellon University, look forward to seeing you seeing the impact of the class of 2015 around the world. We want to support and celebrate you every step of your way. So my final request to you today is to stay in touch. Be connected with Carnegie Mellon University forever. Stay involved. Take advantage of the CMU alumni network. Connect to one another. If the 115-year history of Carnegie Mellon University is any indication, those of you sitting here receiving your degrees today will be movers, shakers, leaders, innovators, extraordinary artists, humanists, social scientists, designers. So there is a piece of practical advice when you look to the person sitting in front of you, next to you or behind you, remember, 20, 30 years from now, they'll be leaders. They'll have a lot of resources. Some of them may be your boss. Be nice to them. It'll come in handy. Keep in touch with them. With, together with them, you will change the world. My warmest congratulations and best wishes to each and every one of you. Congratulations. We will conclude today's ceremony by singing the Alma Mater by the Vocal Performance Class of 2015. We invite you to please rise and sing along. The words to Alma Mater can be found in your program. Also, please remain standing at the conclusion of the Alma Mater for the recession of graduates. Congratulations. <laughs>